In this video lecture, we're going to talk about one-dimensional steady-state conduction. We've talked about the plane wall and thermal resistances. This time we're going to talk about something called the composite wall. So often you may have multiple layers, even multiple uh, conductive layers. So you may have three different types of materials, for example, all lined up together. So now your heat has to flow through, in this particular case, five different things in series. So this would be known as the composite wall or a composite wall. So we have three different materials A, B, and C with, through which heat has to conduct. And then we also have convection on the left hand side with the hot fluid and on the right hand side with the cold fluid. But as you can see there is this overall temperature difference here with the temperature higher on the left. So that's going to create a driving force all the way through as heat goes from left to right. So heat's going to be leaving this hot fluid and getting into the cold fluid. And as a reminder, we can quantify that total flow of heat by summing up the total thermal resistance, so all five of these, two of convection and two and three of conduction, we can sum those all up to get the total thermal resistance, and then we can quantify the total flow of heat by just looking at these two temperatures on the extreme ends. So in total, our equation for heat transfer would look like this. So we'd have our five different thermal resistances, we'd have our two extreme temperatures, but knowing those two extreme temperatures and knowing all of the thermal properties of our system, we could quantify the total flow of heat without needing to know all of these intermediate temperatures here. However, as before, we can still equate different pieces of this to create more equations and solve for those unknowns. So if we wanted to know, for example, T2, we could take and, well, let's actually let's start with TS1. If we want to know TS1, we could take TS1 and equate it to this equation. We could take this part and this part and equate them together um, to each other. So we'd get our total delta T and our total thermal resistance. And we'd have this smaller delta T, which is coupled with a smaller resistance. But the ratio of those two things would be the same for for this and this. So we could that would create an equation by equating them, we would only have one unknown TS1. So, you, as you noticed, when we solve the, when we use this thermal resistance method, we have the delta T on top of this thermal resistance. So each of those layers comes with a thermal resistance. So looking at this figure, I want you to stop and think. You can hit the pause button after I'm done asking the question if you want. Which thermal resistance in this picture is the highest? So go ahead and pause if you want. So just looking at this, it looks to me like the delta T here is the biggest. And it looks like the delta T either here or here is the smallest. So that smallest delta T is going to be coupled with the smallest thermal resistance, but the biggest delta T is going to be coupled with the largest thermal resistance. So in other words, because we have the, um, the biggest delta T here, that would need to overcome the largest thermal resistance. Or put another way, if we know that this convective layer has the highest thermal resistance, we're going to need to have a bigger driving force through that particular layer to equal the same rate of heat transfer as the others. So just looking at this by inspection, we see that this convection layer has the highest thermal resistance because that is coupled with the highest delta T. And conversely, one of these layers, it's hard to see just by inspection, but one of these layers would have the lowest thermal resistance because that is, is balanced out by the lowest delta T. Okay, let's ask another question. Just looking at the solid layers, which one of those has the lowest thermal conductivity? So the one with the lowest thermal conductivity would be this middle layer. So it's going, of the conductive layers, that is going to have the highest thermal resistance. And as you can see, thermal conductivity shows up in the denominator. So a lower thermal conductivity would um, be coupled with a higher thermal resistance, which would be matched with a higher delta T. So one way of thinking about this is if this were wood or something with 
better thermal insulative properties. Well, if you're if you're inside your house, if you're inside a building that's made out of wood and it's nice and warm inside the building, but outside is freezing cold, well, you could go up to the wood, you could touch the inside of that wall, and it would still feel relatively warm because it's close to that uh, it warmer inside, assuming the building is heated. Whereas if you think about if the wall were made out of steel, so I guess what I'm saying is the wood would be a better insulator, which means you'd have a higher delta T. So if it's cold outside, you might still feel a relatively warm temperature inside. Whereas if you had a layer that were made out of something like steel, you should know from experience that steel conducts heat a lot better. So it would have a higher thermal conductivity, a lower thermal resistance, and this lower delta T. So if it were cold outside, you would feel that steel wall and it would likely feel much colder than a wood wall would in the same circumstance. So that's just another way of thinking about it to help conceptualize this concept of thermal resistance and thermal conductivity. If we wanted to increase the thermal resistance using the same materials, one thing we could do would be to lengthen them out or make them wider so that L would be bigger. So just making any particular layer thicker would give you more thermal resistance. So adding thickness would certainly increase the thermal resistance. Even if the wall is made out of steel, if you made that wall thicker, the steel itself would have a relatively higher thermal conductivity. Okay, so why is this important? Where would you actually see composite walls? So let's go back to this drawing we showed in the last video lecture. So if this is some kind of room, or this is a building, or this is the inside of an oven, or the inside of a chamber, or a vehicle. So we would have some kind of air here, there would be some circulation, we'd have some kind of air outside or some other kind of fluid. So where would you actually see composite walls? So let's use the example if this were a furnace or an oven. So the purpose of a furnace or an oven is to heat something. So if you're adding a bunch of energy to heat something, well, you want to retain that heat, right? So you'd want to have it be insulated in some way. So you might have an insulation layer here. Well, to protect that insulation layer, you might have steel, a steel liner on the inside, and then you might also have a steel liner on the outside. So certainly composite walls are all over the place. If this were a building, so you would have like a drywall on the inside, and then you'd have insulation on in the middle, and then you'd have um, you'd have your siding on the outside of the wall. So certainly composite walls are are fairly ubiquitous in a lot of different applications. It's actually quite rare to have a wall that's just made out of a single material. So this concept can be really useful um, for a lot in a lot of different ways. A couple of notes on this thermal resistance method. If you've been following the video lectures closely, um, you'll know that when there is a generation term in our circuit, um, the flow of heat will no longer be constant. So let's say we had a generation layer here. There was something embedded within that system that it generated heat as a function of its volume or as a function of its distance. So what would happen is, although you may have convection coming in here, well, as that heat passes through, it's going to encounter more and more generation. So all of that energy being generated has got to go somewhere. So it's either going to go out to the right or to the left. So the flow of heat would actually, if it's going to the right, that flow of heat could actually accumulate as you go through the wall, which means if you plotted uh, Q as a function of X, it would not be a constant line, which means that you can no longer equate all these different terms together. The, the energy flow by convection on the left side and the energy flow by conduction on the right side, for example, you would no longer be able to just equate those because you can't guarantee that they will be equal. You'd have to do a more in-depth analysis. So you can no longer equate the flow of heat or the flow or flux because as you have generation, the deeper you go in, you're going to be accumulating heat along the way. So um, if this part were generating, however, that heat would be going somewhere. So you could actually apply the thermal resistance method for the non-generating parts of your system. So you could take the thermal circuit from here out into this fluid, assuming these others are not generating, and you could just take the thermal resistance method from here to here, but it would not apply, well, at least it would not apply within that generation layer. Similarly, if your system is not at steady state, 
your flow of heat will also not be constant with respect to x. So let's think about that a little bit. So let's say that we start out with this temperature profile. Let's say this hot fluid isn't flowing yet. So we start out with a temperature profile that looks just flat. If maybe if T infinity one and T infinity four were the same temperature, for example. But then suddenly we kicked on the heat here. So that's gonna cause our system to undergo a change dynamically. And eventually this flat temperature profile would become this other temperature profile. But what happens in between is that you're gonna get some curved lines. You will not have this constant flow of heat with respect to X during that time. Another way of thinking about that is as that heat starts to flow here on the left, that heat is going to be absorbed. Some of it's going to be absorbed into the solid itself. So as it gets absorbed, it's no longer, that portion of the heat is no longer flowing through the system. Some of it gets absorbed. So you'd see your flux be uh, lower. It's not, it's not passing through the solid anymore. Some of it's being absorbed. So we cannot use the thermal resistance method when the system is not at steady state. And then finally, if K is not constant, that means that our TDX would no longer be constant. And there, this just would become a far less convenient method to use. The R term would have to be some more complex form. So we're just not going to cover that in this course. There's another concept that's very important called the overall heat transfer coefficient. And this is really just an algebraic way of rearranging some of those same equations we've been looking at. So, so far, we've written the resistance rate equation in terms of total thermal resistance, R sub T, or R sub total, which would be the sum of all R sub T's. So we could also rearrange that equation and write it like this. So here's our delta T. We could have that same delta T. And instead of using all the thermal resistances and dividing, we could multiply that by U. So U is something called the overall heat transfer coefficient. And basically what that does is it rearranges this equation. It's just a simple rearrangement. And it puts it into this form that looks a lot like Newton's law of cooling. So if you remember Newton's law of cooling, we've looked at Q for convection equals H A times delta T. So we've replaced that H with just this U. And really what's happening inside that U is it lumps everything else that's happening into our system within it. So because we can express our rate law with these two extreme temperatures and the total thermal resistance of each layer, we can just rearrange that and express it differently so that it looks more like Newton's law of cooling. And this is something that's used, this is a convention that's used frequently for heat exchangers. So UA, this overall heat transfer coefficient times the area, that product is just the inverse of our total thermal resistance. So here's our total thermal resistance. If we just took one over the total thermal resistance, we'd get uh, UA. So alternatively, we'd have UA equals one over R total. So that's an important thing to remember. So if we wanted to solve for U by itself, we could just uh, move that A from here down to here. And we can solve for UA, which would have the same units as a convective heat transfer coefficient. It would have units of watts per meter squared per Kelvin. So why are we introducing this now? This will come in very handy. It'll be very important when we're talking about heat exchangers. So this overall heat transfer coefficient is a very important term. And you'll use it a lot more when we're talking about heat exchangers. But for now, we're just introducing what it means.